Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. We continue with the topic of neural network, right? Neural networks is a big topic. It would deserve a full series of lectures and there is one called deep learning. Um, actually, there's, I'm in my deep learning lecture that I give typically at the master level, I'm following the slides from the Stanford people. So there's a really nice course on the Stanford website from, I think it's from 2017 or something. And if you, please ask in Rocket Chat, I can send you a link. That's really something if you are, um, have nothing to do over the Christmas break and uh, you want to spend some time, go through the whole lecture. It's really, it's really very nice. So you learn a lot. It's all well explained. You can also have all the explanations in German. If you go to the Mediathek, I'm using exactly the same slides. And if you dig deep enough, you will find, I think, a German version of that one too. But let's have a short version of the neural network story. So last time already, I told you something about neural networks in a very basic manner, basically following two chapters in Chris Bishop's great book on neural networks. And today um, we continue with the following. So last time where we stopped was, okay, we can have a forward computation. Basically we are doing supervised learning. So we have an input X, which could be an image of a digit. And we have an output Y, which could be, for example, what digit it is. And now we are writing just some weirdly looking mathematical function using tangent superbolicus and some linear operations, whatever. It should be just a complicated enough function kind of to capture the mapping from the input X to the output Y. Okay, so that is the basic idea. Now, the key thing is here, if you would if you start writing a program and you would say, okay, my digits have like bars and something like with a logical point of view, you would never come up with linear algebra as a solution. Instead, you would maybe look for something dark up here, something dark over there. And if then else, then it's a seven. And if you have something dark over here and here, then it's an eight or something. So you would have like a complicated description. This is totally generic. This is just linear algebra here. So that is a surprising thing. However, the program is not done yet. Here are some open variables. So these variables W1, W2, W3, B1, B2, B3, they are not part of the model. So those are the ones that you need to learn from your examples. And now the power here comes to the deep learning, having a very generative way of writing complicated functions from X to Y, with zillions of parameters. And now the key is this combination of operations here is so flexible that we hope that also the mapping from an image of a digit to the digit is possible, okay? These parameters, they need to be tuned automatically by lots of examples. And this then can be just done by gradient descent. So we compare the output of our complicated function with the target value of the true value this is called the residual and we calculate the squared error. So this is basically the residual will be, um, in this case, it's a vector of 10 possibilities, which tell us so how much we think that it's one of, one of the different classes. And then by calculating the inner product of the residual, we get something like a squared error. And now by having a gradient descent on the error, yeah, and calculating the gradient with respect to all these parameters, kind of we can adjust all of these parameters automatically to minimize the squared error. And basically in order to approximate the mapping from X to T in this case. So that is the, the whole story here. Of course, what kind of functions and operations you are doing here, you are completely free. You can plug in whatever you like and you can also invent new operations here. Okay, so it really doesn't matter. Um, now the key uh, idea here is to me that this is a form of automated programming. Yeah, so in programming 101, I had it on an earlier slide, maybe you learned how to sort sequences, right? And you had bubble sort or quick sort and you learned all these different algorithms and the algorithms are made in such a way when you have a particular input, you will have a particular output and you fully understand everything. Here you don't fully understand how to map from X to T or X to Y in this case. For that reason, you put something totally generic with lots of parameters and you let it automatically being programmed through gradient descent, okay? So that is why I think machine learning is like programming, but automated programming, okay? So you automated the process of finding the best program. 
of course, making like classical programmers unemployed in this case, right? So they, the task might be much too difficult to do this. Are they really unemployed? No, of course, you also need someone who writes now the toolboxes for these kind of automatic programming. So you need programmers, you still need them. Anyway, we showed that basically by going backwards with the matrix differential calculus, putting a D in front of the E and then moving it to all these different expressions here, we are getting the gradients with respect to all these different parameters. And actually it turns out we get some nice formulas that can be calculated just in backward direction. So we first calculate the gradient of the offset and then we calculate the gradient of the weight matrix of the last layer. And then we use these results kind of and push them further to get at the end, like also gradients for all the other parameters. So we're going backwards through the whole computation. Okay. And um, last time we did it by hand, but there's a very nice way to do this automatically so that you don't have to derive these formulas, but you typically only implement the forward computation and then you use automatic differentiation, which is a classic technique from the 80s, okay? And applying automatic differentiation to these kind piece of code, you get the gradients for free. And when you compute the gradients, you can update basically the parameters. And that's the automatic programming here. Now this backward computation or these gradients here is really just, um, it's called a backward something automatic differentiation, backward chain automatic differentiation. So there's forward automatic differentiation and there's also a backward version. In the context of neural networks, this backward computation is often called backpropagation, but it's really just an instance of the well-known automatic differentiation ideas that were used earlier. Um, now, what is backpropagation? Again, let me start with a simple example. I'll give you some description of it. And then we go into the slides from the Stanford people because they have a really nice worked out example where we can go through to get like an understanding with some numbers, okay? So let's first look at it abstractly. So this is now a simple neural network, okay? Let's assume they are all scalar. So what I mean by this is, so W is a scalar, the output of F1 is a scalar, everything is a scalar. It's just a complicated function that is made by like nesting some functions into each other. Um, so now for a single data point and a target value T, I can define my loss function, which is just a squared error in this case. Um, and then my goal would be find the parameters that minimize the loss. So as a programmer, this is like a bad solution, right? I mean, this is not the solution to my problem yet. Only if I tweak the parameters, then I have the solution. And this is done by the automatic gradient descent by minimizing this loss. So now what is backpropagation? Backpropagation is now an efficient way to calculate these derivatives that we need. Okay, so that is backpropagation like in a very high level description. So it's a clever recipe to get all these gradients. So let's rewrite our network into layers as we did before. Okay. And now if we apply the chain rule, like succinctly starting from the back and going to the front, we get all these gradients. So let's start with the gradient with respect to W3. So first of all, it's the gradient of, um, uh, we, we can have the gradient of the Z4 with respect to W3, and we can have the gradient of the loss with respect to Z4, where Z4 is just equal to Y, okay? So this gradient of my error with respect to Z4 or with respect to um, uh, the Y, it is just Y minus T times one, okay? So that is something very simple. Actually, it's just a residual. And the, um, uh, gradient of Z4 with respect to W3 depends on the form of F3. So if F3 is just a linear operation between W3 and W and Z3, it will be just Z3, for example, but it could be a more complicated function. Um, why is this a chain rule? So you might be surprised. And that is something I want to show you once on the board. So typically in Germany, in high school, we learn the chain rule with a slightly different notation, right? And there we typically have something like y is equal to f of g of x. And then we would say, um, so let's say this is a function h of x, and we call it y in this case. And then we would say now the derivative of h of x 
it is the derivative of the outer function and then applied on this inner location, okay, times the derivative of the inner function, okay? So that is the formula you learned. However, here's a much nicer formula. The much nicer formula is just to say, okay, it's partial h by partial x. Let's say evaluated at x. So this thing is a function, okay? Now let's extend this fraction, okay? So let's say, let's write it like this. Let's plug in here, basically now, um, the two functions. Uh, okay, so let's say this is now G composed with F. Okay, so this is just a composition of the two functions. And um, let's extend it now by saying, so the delta F with delta F here just cancels out. Okay, um, if I don't do it like that, but instead now split it, I have the derivative of the outer function with respect to its argument and of the inner function with respect to its argument. So if you prefer and call this thing down here z, you could also say, um, is my notation good? No, it's kind of good. Um, so let's, let me rewrite this. So the notation is the important thing here. Okay, so let me rewrite this slightly different. So first of all, let's introduce a couple of more letters here. So let's say this is g of x and that's the same as f of z, okay? So the z is the g of x. And the whole thing is called y. And now I'm interested in the partial derivative of y with respect to x, okay? So that's better. And the intermediate value is the z. And that is the one that I'm here introducing. So I'm here multiplying the top and the bottom with the partial of z. And now the formula is kind of super simple because you can just cross out the delta z. Or you interpret this as a derivative of y with respect to z, which is the derivative of f, right? And this is the derivative of z with respect to f with respect to x, which is the derivative of g, okay? So this is a simpler notation. However, for people who were grown up like this, it's confusing, as you just saw on the board, how I messed it up, okay? So, but it's basically, both are called the chain rule. So this is the chain rule, and it's useful if I have these variables defined, and I can talk about it like those, and I have the other chain rule over here if I want to write it in terms of functions. But it is exactly the same thing. So, now, this term is the delta z, with respect to x, am I right? No, it's wrong. So this is exactly that one, and the g prime of x is exactly the term down here, okay? So the chain rule actually can be written really easily. And that's how we did it. So the, um, um, the partial derivative of e with respect to w3, yeah, I can rewrite by having like an intermediate step at the z4, okay? And that's just it. Now, let's go to the next step, w2. For this, I basically now need to rewrite the partial derivative of z4. I replace it with the partial derivative of z3, and then I have z3 with respect to w2. So in a way, I'm having here a chain through these different things. So maybe I'll show you the picture here. So I'm having a picturized uh, version of z1 where I'm basically having here the z1 is going into the function and then I get the z2 and so on and so forth and at the end I have the loss. And now for the derivatives we can view it like this. We get at the beginning we get the derivative of e with respect to itself which is just constant 1 and after that I having the z2 and uh, the z4 and the z4 is now the derivative of e with respect to the z4. So this is like an intermediate derivative, which then gets on past to all the other terms. And basically the first term here is multiplying now this derivative with the local derivative at f3, which is dz4 by dw3. And the product of those two will give me the term down here. To go on to this derivative here, it is basically this one. Oh, I can draw here. How nice is that one? So let's do this. So that one over here 
Yeah, if you cancel out the delta four, you will see that this is the partial derivative of delta e with respect to delta z3, okay? And that gets multiplied with delta z3 by delta two and so on and so forth. So there's a recursive function basically, right? Which is just what written down here. So now to compute a function value, I'm doing a forward pass through my network in a way. And now to do the back propagation to calculate all these derivatives, I'm doing a backward pass through the whole thing. And everything that's happening here is chain rule, okay? Um, I wrote it up for you in great detail. Um, however, I think this, this is basically what's happening and those are the steps, but this looks super complicated. The explanations on the slide from the Sanford people are much better and those I will show you next, okay? So let's go through an example, which is more useful, I guess, than the way I wrote it down. Um, however, first of all, notation is here a danger, danger zone. So the problem, if, if we talk about scalars, this notation is super simple, right? So this derivative of a scalar function with respect to a scalar is a scalar and all the intermediate terms are as well. Once you have a vectorized representation and you write it for a vector, things get a bit more complicated. Suddenly the, derivative, the partial derivative of y with respect to x is now an m by n matrix. And this is exactly the Jacobian matrix where the um, M is the number of outputs and the N is the number of inputs, okay? And then this chain rule becomes linear algebra. So it's becoming multiplying a vector times a matrix. And of course, here it gets even more dangerous if you have everything in here, including matrices, which we have on your networks. And if you want to write something like that, Maybe this still has a good representation because the E is a scalar. So in principle, the partial derivative of a scalar with respect to a matrix can be represented as a matrix. However, the partial derivatives of a vector valued function with respect to a matrix is already like a tensor type of thing. And then the operations here get kind of unclear on what dimensions you are doing. So there's some danger with the notation here. So that's always something that you want to keep in mind. Um, the problem here is for the intermediate terms. The problem is not for the resulting terms at the end because the resulting terms at the end are is a scalar valued function where we take the derivative with some more complicated shape, but it will overall have the same shape as the stuff standing at the bottom, okay? Anyway, this is just a warning. Let's look at an example of what is backpropagation. And here's the link to the course. Um, so this is Stanford's course on deep learning, so deep neural networks for computer vision from 2017. It is also updated every year. Um, in that year, it was held by Fai Fai Lee, Justin Johnson and Serena Young. And there are videos online for this class as well that you can watch and it's super popular. However, these slides, I think, were also made by Andre Karpati, who was also a PhD student before Justin Johnson of Fai Fai Lee. So Andre Karpati um, moved on, but I think lots of the material in these slides is also created by him. I think he designed the class even uh, from what I know. Okay, so here comes the example. First of all, I, I literally copied this slide as you can see. New is only this yellow stripe here which says that this is stolen from another class. Okay, so this is not my slide. I took it from them. Um, I wrote Justin an email a couple of years ago and he says, yes, fine, we are fine if you use this in class. So I think that's okay. So now what example are we looking at here? So we look at a really simple function and this function has nothing to do with the neural network, okay? Or with deep learning or anything. This is just a function with scalars. It's a function where we sum up two numbers and multiply a third. Of course, this is a computational graph of this function now, right? So we first sum up X and Y, so we have a plus operator, and then we multiply the result with Z. So this is a computational graph of this mathematical expression. Aha, so a neural network that we draw on the board is nothing else than a computational graph for a particular mathematical expression, okay? So that's always the case, also for all the other super deep neural networks. So let's do the forward propagation first. Let's plug in x being equal to minus two, five, minus four. 
This is done in this graph notation by writing a green number at the top of this no, uh, of, the, of these connections, of these arrows, okay? So this is, I'm stressing this because at the bottom part, we will write the gradients afterwards. So let's be very careful about notation. So right next to these nodes, so this is an input node, you write the minus two, here you write the plus five. Okay, great, then we have the plus operation, so let's sum it up and write the result to the top right-hand side of this operation, which is the three. And similar down here, we get the minus 12. What about this f? The f is just giving this location a name, okay? So the f is saying whatever is standing up here, that is the value of f, okay? And this graph here is a nice representation and we will look at it now for the next 30 slides, okay? So it won't change. So let's talk about derivatives. First of all, let's give these intermediate results also a name. Yeah? Let's use these, the result three here, let's call it q. Or with other words, q is equal to x plus y. So why is it useful? It's useful because we want to use this kind of notation for the chain rule. We don't want to use this notation, okay? This notation is only useful for super simple stuff like this. But if you have high dimensional functions and if you have lots of them, this notation is a mess. And this notation is like super minimalistic and you can use it when you give the different intermediate results a name. Luckily, that's exactly how we write programs, right? I mean, when you write a computer program, you give names, you give variable names. And if you reuse the result at different location, you give it another variable name. And those variable names are exactly the ones that you can write down here in this formula. And those are exactly the ones that they're using here on their slide. Okay, let's Okay, to warm up, let's calculate a couple of derivatives here. So what about delta q by delta x? Okay, this is just the coefficient in front of the x. So this is super simple. It just follows from the q being defined like that. Similarly, the derivative with respect to y. Why is it useful later on? I mean, later on, we want to have the derivative of f, of this letter here, with respect to x of that letter and we want to use the chain rule. So we need the intermediate results along the way. And this is one intermediate result for the gradient, okay? So what about the other function, f being equal to q times z? So also here we can al already calculate some stuff and put something in here what we know. So the derivative with respect to q is z and the one other one is q, so it's the other way around. Okay, but actually we want the derivatives of the overall value with respect to the inputs. By the way, how does it now translate later on to deep learning? For deep learning, we will also have a scalar valued output, the loss, and we have certain inputs, and the inputs are typically the images or the targets or these kind of things, but think of the weights and of the bias also just as inputs to the neural network, right? Then you see why this discussion applies. So for example, the z could be a weight that we want to update, right? And the y could be a bias, and the x is the actual image that we plug into the, the network, okay? So that's why we write it like this. But we want to have it like very generic. So the starting point of the computation is typically back here. So first of all, the derivative of f with respect to itself is just one, right? I mean, you just cancel it. So that's it. So let's put a one down here. So that is the gradient of f with respect to itself. Um, now, what about that one? Down here, you will write down the gradient of f or the gradient or the partial derivative of f with respect to z, right? So it's always the partial derivative with respect to f that you put into the network, but with respect to the variable you are currently looking at. Okay, so let's check that one. So that was delta f by delta z is equal to q. So we need to copy the q value from here down to here, okay? Let's fill up the rest. So what about down here? Over here, we need to plug in the value z, right? So it's minus four. So far, so good. Let's go on. Now, what about the derivative of this one? That's more complicated. And here we now use the chain rule, okay? We use basically the intermediate result q for which we have already the derivative and we need to multiply it with the local operation here, which is basically the formula for q. And that one is the derivative of q with respect to y was equal to one. So if we multiply it, it means we just copy the minus four over to here, okay? 
Similarly over there, we also just copy the minus four over to the other one by just using the chain rule, okay? You can try to write a similar explanation using this notation, but it won't make you very happy, okay? So it's not very nice. This is more like computer scientist style of thinking. Intermediate results get a name, and then you can use this nice notation over there. Okay, so far so good. So what happened here? We have some computational node f that gets some inputs x and some outputs y, and it produces a z, where z is now just a name for the output. Then we computed first some local gradients here. So the local gradients are stuff that we can just compute. So it's just about this local image here. So it's just the derivative of the output with respect to the first input and the derivative of the output with respect to the second input. So now what's happening in back propagation, we get somehow we get a gradient upstream from upstream. Okay. Somehow we get already computed the partial derivative of the loss, so of the final output with respect to the current output name that we have here. So that is what's coming in. And then we just use the chain rule to pass on now the, the derivative of the loss with respect to the x. And how do we do this? We multiply the incoming gradient or the, with the local gradient, right, of the corresponding variable. And that's it. So that's what's going on. And that also applies for the loss at the beginning. At the beginning, you have like, the loss with respect to the loss, which is equal to one, and you multiply it with the local gradients of the loss function. And this is how you get started. Good. Of course, these ones here are again going into these kind of circles and there will be again some local gradients, okay, that you need to take care of. Let's look at a more complicated example. Now this is already getting closer to being a neural network, right? So we have a sigmoid function, one divided by one plus e to the minus, and then this is a linear combination with a bias term. Okay, so this is, is now an operation that could happen in a simple neural network. Let's look at the computational graph. Of course, the starting point is simple. We just multiply here and multiply and we sum up the results and we add the bias. And then come some other operations. And the nice thing about these slides is they're really precise. So the operation is times minus one. Okay. So times minus one, if you like carrying, it's like times where you plug in one of the inputs already and it's a function in one input. So times minus one is a function you can apply to a scalar. So you apply it to the scalar one. Then you apply the E function. Finally, you apply the plus one function and then you apply the one divided by function. Okay. And you get a particular result. Great. So again, note, we wrote like the forward computation we wrote on top of the arrows. And in this case in green, let's do the backward computation. And for this, we need like a little collection of formulas. Okay. So let's write everything down that we know. Suppose your function is e to the x. What is the gradient? It's e to the x. And here they use another way that we could have used over here if I wouldn't have messed up. So we could also say that the result e to the x is equal to f. So we could use for the output, we can also use the function name. And that's what they say. So they say the f is equal to f of x, okay? But they omit the bracket open and close. They just have a new variable name over here. Great, here's a linear function. Of course, the derivative is the coefficient. Here's the one divided by x function. It's minus one divided by x squared. This should be all clear to you. The only confusing thing is that it's always called f. But this is just, it, it's just a collection of formulas. So don't get confused by this. And then there's a constant function, which is basically one. Let's go on. Let's go backwards through the whole thing. The starting point is to write a one below the output. Okay. So the very last output is a loss in this case, the result. So it will be this F up here and it's one. So let's apply this formula. So what would I have to write down here? Any suggestions? Does anybody want to comment on this or put it into the chat? Oh, there's something in the chat anyway. Oh, there's a chat. Okay. In forward, is it that like iteration is happening to reach? Oh, I, I comment on that one later. Okay. Any suggestion on, on what to put down here at this location? Okay. I, I walk you through it. So, there's an incoming gradient, which is a one. And then there's a local gradient, right? So the local gradient is telling me the partial derivative of the output with respect to the input. And I need to multiply those two, okay? So 
Here basically the function is one divided by x, so and the local gradient is this one, it's minus one divided by x squared, okay? So what is the x here? The x is the 1.37, so I need to calculate here minus one divided by 1.37 squared times one. Okay, so let's check whether this is really true. So minus one divided by, what is it now? 1.37 times 1.37. Okay, so this is the guess, minus 53, okay? Let's check whether that's the case, whether that's what they did in their slice. Yay, they did it. So it's minus 0 0.53, okay? Of course, you can just flip through the slides when you sit at home, yeah? But don't, do it yourself. Test yourself whether you get the same numbers, okay? If you don't get the same numbers, there's something that you didn't understand. Let's take the next one, okay. So, plus one, okay, that's an easy one. So the incoming gradient is minus 0 0.53. You multiply it with the local gradient. The local gradient is one, okay? So we just copy it over. And it is exactly what's happening here, okay? So you just copy it over. Next is the exponential function. Okay, that's the more curious one. So again, the x here is the minus one, okay? and I know the local derivative is just e to the x, so it's just e to the minus one. Curiously, the e to the minus one was also computed for the 0 0.37. So I guess what we need to do here now um, is we need to multiply minus 0 0.53 times 0 0.37. Let's check that. Um, 0 0.37 times minus 53. So the output will be minus 0 0.19, and it is, okay, luckily. The good thing is, if I'm wrong, right, then I need to do more thinking here, then I explained it wrong, right? But luckily it's true, great. So that's what is actually what's calculating here. I mean, I'm not doing this talk the first time, right? I've done it several times, so I know what's happening here. And that's, by the way, why I also like the slides. They really explicitly spell out what you need to compute. So that's super useful. Okay, let's go on. Let's do the next one. So that is um, a times x. So the derivative is one, uh, minus one, since we multiply with the minus one. So basically the upstream gradient gets multiplied with the local derivative with the minus one. So this will be 0 0.2, okay? So, so far so simple. Let's move on. Now we get this plus business over here. As you know, um, the plus business, yeah, for that one, um, it is basically the computation down here, right? We are adding something to my variable where w2 is now the variable. And so it will be just multiplied by one. So it will be just the 0 0.2 and the 0 0.2. They wrote it out explicitly for us. So the upstream gradient is the 0 0.2 and the local gradient here is the one because it's just a plus sign, okay? And so we get the 0 0.2. You see that the plus sign is kind of, um, moving the gradient to both of the branches. So what does the gradient mean? It means at this location, if I twiggle the value a little bit, how would the loss change? So it will change with the weight of 0 0.2. If I would twiggle like the node at this location, how would the loss change? It will change with minus 0 0.2. So what does it mean if I know that this thing is a summation of two parts, I should say, so if I twiggle the top one, it has the same influence if I twiggle the bottom one. So both get kind of the same gradient passed on, okay? Okay, next one. So um, oh, the next one is already filled in. So the plus always kind of distributes it to the different branches here. Now, what about the times one? So for the times one, it's kind of flipping, right? So the upstream gradient is always 0 0.2, but the local gradient is just the other value. So to go up here, I need to multiply the 0 0.2 with the minus one of the x0, because this is w0 times x0. So the a down here is, for the w0, it will be the x0. The x0 is the factor which, which I'm multiplying my w0. That's why I need to multiply the 0 0.2 with x0. That is the factor, the factor a, and vice versa. So somehow this is kind of switching, right? So you get a gradient, and depending on the other value, your gradient will be large or small, okay? Good, and the same happens now, uh, whoops, the same will happen down here as well. Is there a slide missing? 
Yeah, okay. It will it will happen also down here. Looks like there's a slide missing. I don't know why. Good. Um, of course, we know this thing, what we computed here is so-called sigmoid gate. So let's abstract from this, okay? And let's now do the same thing, but now on a, on a higher level, okay? So let's rewrite our function here as sigma of x, which, be, which is one divided by one plus e to the minus x. And let's say now we have a macro for that one. So let's calculate the derivative, the local derivative of the sigma of x. And when you go through the mass, surprisingly, you can get it to a nice form. Yeah, you can show that the derivative of that one with a bit of shuffling around the E functions can be written as one minus sigma of X times sigma of X. Okay, let's just shortly, briefly consider this formula with a little plot. Okay, so the sigmoid function, that's the one that is looking like this, right? And so what it's saying is that the, the um, man, let's do it like this. So the derivative here is super flat, so it's zero. Okay, so this is um, uh, sigma of minus 100, for example, at this location, right? The derivative of sigma minus 100 is almost zero. And here we have um, basically sigma of 100 and the derivative of that one is also almost zero. So let's calculate the value. Sigma of minus 100 is zero. Sigma of 100 is equal to one. Now what's happening if I'm doing something like sigma of x times one minus sigma of x? Basically it says, if one of the values is zero, then the whole thing will be zero. Okay, so let's look at this location. Here the sigma of 100 is one, but one minus sigma of 100, this thing will be zero. So the whole thing will be zero, okay? On the other side, the sigma of minus 100 is zero, so the whole thing will be zero, okay? So that's why on both sides, kind of the derivatives get to zero. And now what's happening in between? Yeah, both values are like something like a half, and then you will have something like a half times a half, something happening in the middle here, okay? So we know that the curvature here will be a quarter, okay? So maybe I should draw it like that. So there's a funny recursive function here. Um, of course, that it's not a super, that shouldn't come as a, as a great surprise to you because the E function is always kind of self-similar in a way, right? So the E function carries its own derivative. So also typically variations of the E functions kind of carry their own derivative information somehow, okay? So that's like a bit hand wavy, but this is why it's not coming as a big surprise. Okay, why is it something useful to know? Let's look at it, what we can do with it. So. Let's say this whole operation now is now a big box, okay? And it's getting as the input a one that we pass in the sigma of x and the output will be a 0 0.23. Now for the backward pass, I need to multiply the 1.0 with the local derivative. But what is the local derivative? The local derivative is one minus sigma of x times sigma of x. So in order to calculate this 0 0.2, I can just take the value 0 0.73 uh, and multi put, plug it into this formula. Okay, so let's do that. So it's just, oh, we still have it here. So let's take um, bracket open, one minus 0 0.7 times 0 0.7. Okay, this is just using the formula. And as it turns out, you get a 0 0.23 which I say now it's close enough. Oh, I did wrong. I did 0 0.73. Okay, I did the wrong one. So it's not close enough. So let's change this. And luckily now we get the 0 0.19. Okay, so the other thing would have been wrong. I would have accepted it kind of, but no, it would have been wrong. So you see now the trick is having this formula makes it very convenient for the back propagation because the local derivative can be computed from the output of the sigmoid gate in a very simple way, okay? That same, a similar formula holds for the tangent superbolicus, where we have this one minus x squared being the de derivative, right? There is also a simple formula. So to locally calculate here the 
Derivative, typically what we're using is the input value x is often appearing in a formula like this one, for example. And sometimes also the output value is used for the computation, like in this formula over here, okay? So that makes it very simple sometimes, like for bigger macros to do these things. Okay, so what patterns are there? I kind of alluded to that one already. Like the add gate, like the plus gate, is a distributor of gradients, right? It's passing on the two down here and the two up there. The max gate, it's like a selector. So it's routing the gradient to one of the things. So you can think of that like, so the resulting value here, the maximum of the Z and the W, basically locally it depends only on the Z, right? If the Z is really larger than the W, it doesn't matter if I fiddle around a little bit with the W, it won't change the output. If I fiddle, out, fiddle around with the Z, then the output will change. So that's why here the gradient is zero, so it's irrelevant locally. Of course, if I wiggle the W a lot, then at some point it will be the new maximum. But derivative is about the, the curvature or the, the, um, uh, yeah, the derivative at a, at a particular location, like it's a local thing. Then there's the multiplication gate uh, and that's like a gradient switcher. So you are kind of switching. So the two is multiplied by the minus four to get over here and the two is multiplied with the three to get down there. Okay, so far so good. Um, any questions so far? I think that's, that's quite clear, right? Great. Um, now, of course, so far we only looked at graphs where we kind of towards the end, kind of we have converging arrows but you could have different branches, right? So you could start here, calculate something, and then the result gets passed to this node and it also gets passed to another node, okay? So even though here are two arrows going out, they are the same numbers. So I'm not super happy with that plot, so let me redraw it. So in my point of view, a more precise plot is, for example, we have the output of that one and that output is going to one node and to another node. So here's really only one output, okay? And there are not two outputs, okay? In particular, I can give it a letter, right? So this could be like a Q or something. So I'm talking about a single output of my node and that is then passed to different branches, okay? However, this plot tells us already what to do. So if I get like a upstream gradient from the branch up here and I get an upstream gradient from the branch down here, basically I need to sum them up. And this is like a graphical way of saying that um, basically I'm having, um, I'm having a sum rule, right? This corresponds exactly to the sum rule that you might be familiar with. So if you have, um, uh, let's say your function age is a sum of some function in x and some other function in x, right? Then the gradient of this thing, so if I take the derivative of these guys, then I'm summing up the derivative of the stuff that comes from this branch and the stuff that comes from that branch, okay? So basically this is like having an x that then gets passed into an f and it gets passed into a g and then finally Okay, here they are not merged before the operation. I'm getting out the age. Okay, so this is basically the graph to that one. And at this location here, right here, you must sum up the gradients. Okay, so that's how you combine these things. Why is it important? Yeah, because I mean, now comes into play object oriented programming thinking, right? So, Java, right? So, how would you implement now a nice toolbox? you want to have for each of these nodes, you want to de define a, an object, okay? Each of these nodes should be an object and it receives messages to calculate then other things. So it could, for example, receive stuff at its input, so messages coming in, and it will output a message, the output. Or it gets like gradients coming from upstream and then it will pass on a message downstream to the other nodes. So you can view that I want to implement this locally and for the computation that has to be done down at this location, I don't want to use any of the other information, only the stuff that is coming in like from neighboring nodes, okay? And that's why um, the whole thing is such a big deal so that you can do this chain rule really, you can 
have a large derivative like from the input to the output and you can split it into all these different pieces and they really nicely align with the forward computation. Let's do the same thing now for vectorized code, okay? So we've seen very simple operation with scalars, with plus times and even E function, one divided. Then we look very briefly, what if we have a macro like a sigma function, how to do it in that situation. Let's go one step further. Let's now use variables here that can have vector, that can be vector valued, okay? And that is now just making the whole thing a little bit more uh, complicated notation wise but the rest stays the same. First of all, what gets passed here? And you see, I, I was always a bit with my words jumping around. I wanted to say, yeah, the partial derivative of L with respect to X, but often I said gradient, but actually it's not really the gradient. It's like the, the partial derivative. So it's something slightly um, different. However, actually those are all gradients. So let me just say, what do I mean now by with these gradient things. And let's also talk a little bit about notation for this one. So typically we talk about gradient. Suppose you have a function um, from R to the M to R, okay, to R to the one, okay? So a vector X gets mapped onto some scalar. Let's call it alpha, okay? Ah, okay, maybe that's confusing. So let's call it Y, but it's a scalar. And um, then we could calculate these partial derivatives of partial y by xi, okay? And then typically these, now you can stack into a vector and you can either make it a column vector or you can make it a row vector. And that's already where the confusions can start. So one convention is to plug all of these into a row vector, yeah? and that has m, and that has sometimes some notational advantages, okay? Sometimes it's good to do it like that. However, you should be always careful what is the right ordering. However, here comes a nice notation, the gradient, yeah, written with this thing called nabla, so this thing is called nabla, yeah, of a function f here with respect to x, this thing now will collect all these in a column vector, okay? So this will be the partial derivatives of all these things and it will be in a column vector. So now how can I be so sure that this must be a column vector? The key here is the shape of this thing must be the same as the shape as of the input, okay? So why is here everything fine and here's no problem? Because we have only r to the one, okay? So now suppose I'm looking at a more complicated one. Suppose I'm having a matrix valued input like this. Now what about the gradient? Then the gradient with respect to W will be also of exactly the same shape. So the gradient always has exactly the same shape as the input. However, there's also this Jacobian matrix. So what about that one, right? So what about the Jacobian matrix? So now that is something that we typically have when we have r to the n, yeah, r to the m to r to the n. Then we have like several outputs. So here we have several inputs and one output, but now we have several outputs. And in that case, I have many more of these partial derivatives. Okay, now I have the partial derivatives y sub j and x sub i, okay? And they now form a big matrix. And this is the Jacobian matrix. If I would do this for i equals one to m and for j equals one to n, okay? So this is the Jacobian matrix, sometimes also called j. And now how does it relate to such a matrix over here? They are very different. The gradient only makes sense if the output is a scalar and then the gradient has the same shape as the input, okay? However, if my output is also higher dimensional, we often talk about the Jacobian matrix, and here now the convention would be that this is an M, ah, I'm already mixing it up, this is an N by M matrix typically, right? Matching our earlier notation where I said 
that the partial derivative of f with respect to x is like a row vector, okay? So the number of rows is the number of outputs and the number of columns is the number of inputs. So what does it mean now if I'm having something more complicated like this? It basically means my Jacobian is a matrix. Yeah, as I said, number of outputs is n and then times n times d, where this is now multiplied and this is just a notation for matrices, okay? So here the number of inputs is like coming from n times d numbers, so I need as many columns. However, the shape of this thing is kind of confusing. Nonetheless, this is the thing we typically use in, in the chain rule, right? So to confuse you even more. And that's where the notation gets really messy at some point. However, luckily for us, so now what should you memorize about this? So the important thing is typically the gradient. So that's the important thing. And it's good to talk about the gradient if the output is scalar valued. Luckily, we are talking about a loss function, which is just a single real number at the end. So in our cases, we have a big computational graph and for all the intermediate results, we can write down the gradient at these locations. And the gradient should have exactly the same shape as the variable on top of it. But let's look at this, this slide. So this might be now part of the con confusing thing. So in comes a gradient where now if z is an r to the 5 vector, this gradient will be also an r to the 5 vector. It must have the same shape. Okay, then there are local gradients and that's where the problem starts. So this could be a Jacobian matrix, right? So this could be like a matrix which has as many inputs as, uh, as columns and the number of rows is the number of outputs. Okay, so this is my using slightly different rotation. So local gradient really has to be here in quotation marks because the Jacobian matrix talking about gradient is kind of weird if we have more than one output. However, possibly that's the case, right? Because we have a linear operation. The, a vector comes in, we multiply it with the matrix and the vector comes out. So the local gradient will be a matrix. Okay, that's just how it is. Um, however, we always have to be careful that these operations kind of match from the sizes. So if this gradient has the same shape as the Z, I can multiply it now with the local gradient. Uh, okay, with the local gradient over here, and that's now, okay, where already the notation is different from what I just told you. So let me write it out. So the delta L by delta Z gets multiplied from the right with the delta Z by delta X. And let's talk about the shapes. So this thing is a Jacobian matrix. So it looks like this. And if I really have the right, uh, if I should be a, a vector matrix multiplication, this thing must be a row vector then this thing is typically written, in this case now, like a row vector. However, the confusing thing for me on this slide is that they also call it a gradient in this case. But actually a gradient must have the same shape as that, but it doesn't have according to this formula over here, okay? So what you should take from this is be always very careful with the shapes. If you talk about the gradient, the easiest convention is it has exactly the same shape. However, here what will happen is the result will be a row vector too if you write it like this, right? And if you don't want to write it like row vector times matrix, then you have to mess around with the Jacobian and you change the convention over there, okay? So it's kind of unfortunate. Anyway, let's look at something more easy. So what about other, of, and here will be a big example on this one, just a second. So this is a bigger example that we go through in a minute, okay? So stay tuned. We go through an example with the vectorized operations. But before that, here are some particular operations which look like super wasteful. So suppose your input is like 4096 dimensional input vector and now you apply a relu or a tangent hyperbolicus or a sigmoid. You do it element wise or component wise. So the output will be also a 4096 dimensional vector. So in principle, the Jacobian, the local Jacobian of this operation will be a 4,000 by 4,000 matrix, which is super wasteful. Why? Because most of the entries are zero, right? So you're not interacting with each other. And so for that reason, the whole thing um, can be re represented as a diagonal matrix. 
So in this case, basically, um, ah, what? What's the size of the Jacobian matrix? Blah blah blah. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So they just blow it up with a batch of data. But the Jacobian matrix is four thousand by four thousand, which is super wasteful. Um, however, it turns out that it's a diagonal matrix where there are only entries on the diagonal. So for these component-wise operations, which are non-linear, also the local gradient has the same shape as the input and the output vectors, which is fine, and we can deal with it. But we need to be careful when a vector comes in here that we use the right operation to combine it then for the chain rule, okay? So here comes now the vectorized example. So this is a function. So the input is having an, a vector and some matrix in this case. And we are multiplying the matrix times the vector. And then we take the norm, which is basically summing up all entries of the result, okay? So this is not by chance that at the end we have a scalar. If it wouldn't be a scalar, it would mess up the notation completely, okay? So the output at the end of backpropagation is always a scalar, like in a loss function. Good, so those are vectors and matrices. Now, let's be more adventurous here. Let's say the, this, this branch here is not carrying a single scalar, but it's carrying the whole matrix, okay? So in particular, it means we can write a matrix up here and the matrix down here for the gradient. And similar, this is a vector. So this is matrix vector multiplication and L2 norm. Okay, so let's plug in the green stuff. So in my opinion, it should have gone to the left-hand side, uh, to the right-hand side here, so that would have been more precise. But we know what they mean here because here's more space. Let's look at the operation. Again, the result is called Q, which is just spelling out the matrix vector multiplication. And then comes the L2 norm, which is now written in terms of the Q, okay? So doing the calculation, row times column, we get 0 0.22. Yeah, maybe we can even do it in hat. So 0 0.1 times 0 0.2 is the 0 0.02. So that's the two at the end. And the 0 0.5 times 0 0.2 um, should give us the rest. Uh, am I right? Ah, oh, no, no. We, we say 0 0.5 times 0 0.4. And this is giving us the other 0 0.2. Oh, matrix vector multiplication is so complicated. Anyway, and I'm sure you can also calculate these ones here. I don't show you now. Okay. Okay. And then the L2 norm, I also don't calculate in my head now. But you can, yeah, this kind of makes sense that this is kind of the right sizes. Good, so far so good. Let's do backpropagation. First step in backpropagation, you put a one down here. Yeah? Is it a one? Does it have the same shape? Yes, I mean, the output was a scalar, right? We are only talking about scalar valued function in backpropagation. So we can really put a one, and this is not a one matrix or something, this is a scalar one, okay? So far so good. Now let's do the next step. The next step is now getting a, more, a little bit more difficult here. So let's write down the derivative of this operation and we write these partial with respect to each of the components. Okay, so the Q is a vector. So the components of Q are called Q1 to Qn, okay? So each of them is basically two times Q1 because it's just a squared function. So far, so simple. Then kind of from this derivation now, we need to invent a good notation for the vector and trying to write it vectorize. After fiddling around a little bit, you will see that the gradient of our function f with respect to q can be written as 2 times q, right? You can check it that 2 times a vector is just 2 times each of these components, which is exactly what we need. So there's always some little bit of art and some little bit of trial and error to getting from the partial derivatives here for the scalar values to like a vector valued notation. But once you have it, we can now just apply it Right, so we can write down here one times this gradient, the local gradient of this operation, which is just two times this vector. So we get the 0 0.44 and the 0 0.52. Okay, so this is just two times Q down here. Okay, let's go on. Let's again calculate the derivatives, the partial derivatives now of each of the entries here with respect to each of the entry of the W. And here you see there are three indices varying. There's the output indices K, which was corresponding in the Jacobian to the row. And then there's the IJ, which are the entries of my input W, and they will correspond to, the, to one of the columns. So with I and J, I can compute one of the columns for the Jacobian. 
However, the derivatives luckily is super simple, right? So how is it working? So first of all, the Q1 is only influenced by the first row. So the first entry of the, of the W must be a one, otherwise it's zero anyway. So we multiply it with the indicator function. That is only one if K is equal to I, okay? Otherwise the derivative will be equal to zero. And then we multiply it with XJ, which is just like the second entry of the W, okay? So this is now actually super simple to calculate and then a clever way of writing things down. Now, here comes now a bit, little bit of non-trivial computations. So let's look at the scalar valued function f and the derivative with respect to the wi. How can we write it? And as it turns out, there is a branching going on. Yeah, why is there a branching going on? Yeah, somehow the, the wij could be in principle in any of the outputs out here. So the wij, the w11, for example, it could end up in Q1, it could end up in Q2, in Q3, Q5, and so on and so forth. So each of them are creating some gradient information, which we need to sum up. So this summation of OK is exactly this collecting gradients from the upstream operation that I showed you before, or with other words, the sum rule, which I put over here a while ago. And for each of these entries Q sub K, we get one of these derivatives, where basically now we can plug in the for the QK, we plug it in here in the back and in the front, we take the upstream derivative. So this in the back is a local derivative of the, the case entry of this vector with respect to the IJ's entry of the W. And we need to multiply it with the upstream derivative that we get for the QK. Okay, so these products here. Now, and we sum it up for each of the entries that we have. So let's plug stuff in. So first of all, the derivative of f with respect to qk was two times qk. Okay, fine. Yeah, that was simple. And the derivative of z1 is the indicator function. Now the indicator function inside a summation is basically selecting one of the summons. And we can get rid of the k where by just plugging everywhere an i, right? So we plug in an i for the q. Okay, since it's Q sub K, K must be equal to one, uh, to I, so we have Q sub I times XJ, and the summation disappears. Good, so this is just a scalar. Now again comes a step where we need to be a little bit clever to write it in a vectorized manner. Okay, oh, or we just compute it. Okay, let's, here they, are they, oh yeah, there comes the formula. Let's first do the computation. So basically what we need to do is we need to take the i's value from the q, for example, the 0 0.22, and we multiply it with the xi. So 0 0.22 times 0 0.2 will be ideally um, oh, two times. Okay, so two times 0 0.22, which is 0 0.44 times 0 0.2 will be ideally this thing up here. 0.088, okay? And similarly for the other values. Two times 0 0.26 is 0 0.52, times 0 0.22 is one of these. I forgot which of one, I guess that one. Okay, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's how you can compute it. Now, of course, we want to have like a vectorized description of this matrix down here, and we could have that one too by writing the outer product of the Q vector with my X vector. And now again, how do you come up with this formula up here? You come up by looking at this partial derivative with respect to the inputs and then coming up with a clever formula so that the entries of the resulting matrix are just these expressions, okay? But the outer product of two vectors is exactly doing that, multiplying each element of the first vector with each other element of the other vector by this generating a matrix, which is exactly what we need. So in principle, we could also use this formula now. We could multiply just this Q value times two and then the outer product with the X value to get this matrix, okay? Just a vectorized way to write things up. Okay, here comes, I don't sure who put it in, maybe I put it in. Always check the gradient must have exactly the same shape. Otherwise you did something wrong. So if you have the gradient with respect to W, you must check the size or the shape of this result here that it has exactly the shape of the W. Then everything is fine, okay?
Good, let's do the other, way, other thing too. Again, doing some computation, Q sub, so what computation did we do? We started with this Q sub K with respect to W I J and then we did some tricks, okay? Let's do the same for the X sub I. This is simpler, we can just read off that the derivative is just W K I, great. Again, um, here now we, we can combine it now for the different values of Q, right? The X is in principle part of all of these values of Q1, of Q2, of Q3, so of different branches, right? So I need to sum up over all possible branches the gradients. So each of them is taking the corresponding upstream gradient, which is the derivative of F with respect to Q sub K and multiplied with the corresponding local gradient. And if you do this, you get this operation. Now again, this is the puzzle. So what matrix, matrix, vector, vector, outer product, inner product, what operation is this? And you recognize it ideally, this is the same as W transpose times the Q, okay? So by taking the upstream gradient, uh, the upstream output value Q and multiplying it with the W transpose, you are doing exactly the right thing. By the way, this, this transpose at first might look a bit surprising, but if you have a rectangular W, yeah, let's say you have three columns, that would mean that you have three inputs and two outputs, okay, then it perfectly makes sense. Since now you want to transform backwardly, so you, your output was two-dimensional, but the X must have a gradient which is three-dimensional, and you only get it by transposing the W the other way around. Then you're going from the output to the input from the shape, okay? So it perfectly makes sense. Good. So far so good. What changed here on this slide? Maybe nothing. So this is like a detailed explanation. Um, so first you should understand the example with the scalars. Then you should understand the example with the sigma of X with the macro type of thing. And then you should look at this gradient stuff where there are some tricks here. And this is not so super obvious anymore to do. But people, they, they use the clever notation here to avoid these notational problems that I mentioned before. Okay, great. So back to our slides. Um, next time, I will tell you more about building blocks for neural networks. Okay, and also next time I will show you some code. So I haven't, I think now time's up and I couldn't show you the code, but I will do next time. So next time I will show you a PyTorch implementation of the code from last time. Yeah, and I show you also a couple of websites where people have done some JavaScript tricks to let neural networks run in your browser, right? Also, you can already Google for it, JavaScript, neural networks run in your browser and Andre Kapati, so those are the keywords. Then you get to a really nice website where you can run IMNIST as a JavaScript program, even on your cell phone. When you call the website on your cell phone, it will run on your cell phone, okay? So that's kind of really nice, okay. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, now let's come to the question that was asked earlier. I, is it still an um, active question? Yeah, maybe. So the question is, in forward computation, is that like the iteration is happening to reach a precise outcome? Um, now there's no iteration really happening here. So it's really, let me show you again this computational graph from the beginning. Um, that one, for example. So that's a nice computational graph. So the computational graph is another representation of my mathematical formula, okay? Some people like it to write it down like that, that's very succinct and small, but the computational graph is more like a compiled version of that one that is telling me what operation do I have to do in a computer, and in particular it tells me in what order do I have to do the computations, right? So I can go through it from left to right, and it will tell me what to compute. A local node can only compute when its inputs are computed. And so until your inputs are not computed, this plus node cannot do anything. It must wait. So, and here's no iteration happening anymore. So this is really unrolled the whole computational process. You can also think if you have a for loop that iterates five times, you can also unroll the for loops into five steps and then have a forward model going these five steps. So here's no iteration happening here, okay? Um, I hope this approximately answers your question. Otherwise, I'm happy to um, answer it now. But this is the end of the lecture, so feel free to um, 
say goodbye. I say goodbye already to everyone and, and stop the recording and then we can discuss this, this stuff further on.